so we're going to start off this video with a challenge. You have two seconds to find 10 year old me in this photo. One, two. If you said this guy, you're wrong. It's this guy. I have the same haircut pretty much and almost the same pose. Anyway, um, this photo was taken in 2004. I was playing against Susan Polgar in a simultaneous exhibition. Uh, and Susan Polgar was playing against, I think, like 30 to 40 opponents at the same time. And the way it worked is she would just go around in a kind of a circle, more like a rectangle of tables. And she would come by my board. I would make my move. And it's a very impressive feat for a single player to play so many players at once. And uh, we played a really interesting game, which I found recently in my old score sheets. And I took a photo of it. So this was my, my score sheet and my handwriting back in 2004. And we played, uh, we played a really fascinating game, which I thought I would share in this video. I didn't know it at the time, but Susan would go on to be my college chess coach. Um, I attended Webster University in 2015. And yeah, she was my coach there for a couple of years. So I think at the end of the video, I'll share an updated photo of me and her from just a few months ago. But I did find another photo. It was a year before we played in the Simul. Uh, this was taken in 2003, May 23rd. And this is the first photo I have of, I guess, me and her. So before we get into the chess, I do want to thank a new sponsor to today's video. And to do that, I'm going to move over to the other camera. Thank you to Morning Brew. Wait, Morning Brew for sponsoring today's video. If you haven't heard of them, they are a completely free email newsletter that focuses on business, technology, current events, finance. And it's a great way just to stay informed and educated about what's going on in the world. I signed up to them a month ago and I learned something new every day. And they even recently featured Abhimanyu Mishra, who became the youngest grandmaster ever at the age of 12. I think it's a much healthier way of starting the day than mindlessly browsing Reddit or social media. I know who you are. So it only takes 15 seconds to sign up. Link is down below. And I really hope it can bring as much value to you as it's brought to me. And with that, let's get back to the chess. So in this game, I was playing black. And actually, if we look more closely at the photo, every single player was playing black uh, against Susan in the simul. This is usually how simuls work. The simuler gets to choose their color, and usually they just play white in all the games while other players have to play black and eat pizza, I guess. So uh, Susan opened with the reti opening, or the reti, uh, one night f3. And at the time, I was rated 1500, so I had a basic understanding of opening principles. I had some like general opening repertoire, but I wasn't super booked up compared to the way I am today. And the interesting thing about this game is I played what I would still play today for the first uh, like six to, to seven moves. We, uh, we transposed into a queen's gambit declined, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e7. And this is still my same repertoire, uh, very classical, Queen's Gambit declined. Um, actually, more recently, I've been playing a6. But for many years, the course of being rated over 2200, Bishop e7 has been my main move of choice, one of the main lines in this position. Uh, Susan played most common move, Bishop g5. And after castling e3, this is a very standard position. Uh, in the Queen's Gambit, where white has maintained the tension and is just focusing to develop very naturally, get the pieces into play. And in this position, black has a few options. Um, H6, I believe, is a mainline. If we check with opening theory, um, 
h6, bishop h4, and b6 is a so-called Tartic Hauer defense. Very solid line. It's been around for many, many years. Uh, the move I played is also very natural. Knight b to d7. Uh, just developing, still staying flexible. Uh, black can still choose to play b6 or c5 or h6. Um, I will say, when I played this game, I didn't really know so much specific theory. And that's one of the big differences between how I play chess today and how I played back when I was rated 1500 is these days I'm much more thoroughly prepared in the opening. And I'll just share one tidbit of opening preparation. Um, if I had this position today, I would most likely play a6. This is one of my more favorite pet lines. And in some of the variations after a6, I'm prepared very, very deeply, like through 20 moves deep. So I'll just share one example line to give a, an illustration of how, uh, how thorough my preparation can be. Uh, the point of a6 is to take on c4, play b5 and c5, and expand on the queen side, fiend cut of the bishop. So it's very typical for white to take here. And after takes bishop d3, uh, the main line continues, knight bd7, castling, rook e8, queen c2, uh, knight to f8. And it's common for white to go for this minority attack with b4, b5. I would play c6, let's say b4. And then from this position, even though both players are out of the opening, both developed and castled and going into the middle game, uh, my, my preparation continues. And there's a cool plan here to play knight g6, bishop d6, and h6 to get the bishop pair. And the critical line, okay, starts with knight g6. Let's say white goes for minority attack. Bishop d6, b5, takes, takes, and now h6, forcing white to trade off one of the bishops. If bishop takes g6, we take on g5. And the main line, bishop takes f6, we take back, takes, takes. And now one of the reasons why I'm showing all of this is to share what used to be a really cool novelty. Um, and it's a pretty rare and lesser known line, but it's a, a cool idea for black. If white plays the most common move, e4, trying to exploit the fact that the queen and bishop are very forkable, either by the pawn or if takes and the knight hits both pieces and uh, c6 is also weak. If white were to play e4, there's a really cool response, knight f4. And this is all based on like engine preparation, we're on move 18, um, and it's still pretty much my, my modern opening preparation. And the point is if white goes for the fork, black calmly slides over with the queen, oh no, my bishop, but oh no, white's kingside is actually in really big danger here. If white were to play the move g3, I believe it's already forced mate after takes, takes, and bishop h3. And good luck stopping queen g2. Um, so a better defense for white here is to play knight e1, defending the pawn. But after rook takes e1, we're still threatening mate. White doesn't have time to take back. And uh, white can still save himself with f3. But after takes, let's say bishop takes, and queen e6. Um, this is pretty much the extent of my preparation in least this variation where black is going to be winning a pawn and having a slightly better position. Um, and all of this is computer approved. So um, I just wanted to show that as inspiration for perhaps the players who struggle playing against d4 and maybe want something a bit deeper and more thorough, especially against the queen's gambit, which is such a common opening these days. But let's go back to the game and we'll see how I actually struggled in the opening given my lack of preparation and just not knowing what to do going into the middle game. So knight d7, it's a, a very fine natural move. Susan plays rook to c1, which is actually very typical in these queen's gambit positions. Whenever there's tension between the d and c pawns, white generally doesn't want to 
to develop the bishop, allowing black to take, and then white will lose a tempo. So it's useful for white to put the rook on a file, which is likely to open and wait for black to take so white can take back in one move with the bishop. So I think at this point, I already didn't quite know what to do. I went ahead and played h6, which is a fine move. I think these days I would be more inclined still to play a6, maybe even b6. But after h6, bishop to f4, I played c6, um, trying to solidify the center. Unfortunately for black, the main drawback uh, in this position is this bishop is really, really sad, given that all these pawns aren't light squares. Um, it's hard to, to be active as black with, uh, with just such a passive light squared bishop, and this did eventually hurt me later in the game. So, okay, Susan plays bishop d3, I play rook e8, castling, and now I go for knight f8. So I am being ultra solid. The problem is my pieces don't really have great harmony, and it's hard to be active as black. Um, because I committed to h6, I'm not actually really having an idea of knight g6, given bishop takes g6 would just damage my, my kingside pawn structure. If I wanted to go for this plan, I should have kept my pawn back on h7, so the knight would be better supported. And we can see after knight e5, it would actually be very nice if my pawn were back, so knight g6 would initiate some trades. But in this position, I am just getting a little bit squeezed. So I played a move trying to trade off some pieces, knight 6 to d7. And I did have the understanding that when one side is low on space. That side does want to trade minor pieces so they can breathe a bit more easily. And in this case, I'm just trying to trade off uh, the knights. Unfortunately, after knight d7, white already has some really cool tactical possibilities. And here, white started with taking on d5. I took back. And then when Susan came to make her next move, she actually took a lot of time, and I do remember her getting to this position and taking at least a minute before making her next move. And this made me really excited because there were like 30 to 40 people in the room, and Susan stopped at my board, taking a lot of time, and I thought I was doing really well because I'm making a chess grandmaster think. I thought, okay, I'm putting her under pressure. But... In reality, she was thinking how to completely tear me apart. And uh, this is basically what ended up happening. Starting with her next move was really unexpected, is knight takes d5. Now, this is a move which I think for a lot of players, like they wouldn't even consider making, given that as white, you just assume that uh, d5 is defended, black is solid. But the point of knight takes d5 is after I take back, white has another very surprising move. And for this, I'll pose a question to the viewers. White to move, what was Susan's idea? How can white justify the sacrifice and get a very strong attack in this position? Feel free to pause the video if you don't see it already. Okay, so before I show the move, I do want to talk about how you actually find the tactic here is you have to realize that the black queen is almost trapped and white has the idea of eventually playing bishop c7 to trap the queen. And even going back to this position, this is a, an idea that should be under white's radar. So after takes, takes, the continuation for white is yet another knight sacrifice, knight takes f7. And now we can see black is under major, major pressure, given if king takes f7, oh no, my queen. And the queen would just be trapped. And you might say that, okay, queen takes c7, rook takes c7, black has three minor pieces for the queen. There's still some fight left, but given that black's minor pieces are very much undeveloped, the king is out in the open, Moves like queen h5 are coming, hitting the king, hitting the pawn. This would be very, very unpleasant to defend as black. 
So after 9F7, I knew I was in trouble. And of course, I saw the idea of bishop c7. And I did manage to find the best move here is queen to b6. Saving the queen, not recapturing the knight, but keep in mind that black is up a piece because white did sacrifice on d5. So white has two pawns for uh, having given away the knight. Now, um, Susan did not take her foot off the gas, played another very aggressive move. Knight takes h6, insisting the knight should be sacrificed. Here, I don't really have much of a choice. I went ahead and took it. And after queen h5, we reach a situation where white is down two pieces. White's down two knights, but has a very, very vicious attack. Both bishops, along with the queen, are pointing at several different targets. h6 is hanging. d5 is hanging. Also, my rook is hanging on e8. And the interesting thing about this position is that if we turn on the engine, the engine will favor black. This engine will find the most precise defensive moves and argue that black is just a material. But for a human to defend this, it's very, very difficult. And I would have had to play um, a bunch of computer moves to survive here. So I did play actually the best move in this position, knight f6, both uh, defending the rook and the pawn and attacking the queen. Very multi-purpose move. Um, I did allow queen takes h6. And now here, I made uh, the mistake of moving back which actually looks natural. Like this is a move I think even today I would consider given that I'm trying to trade queens, get rid of white's main attacking piece. But what I should have done in this position is keep my knight here defending some of the key squares and bring my queen back. And um, if we look at this position with the engine, it will say about minus 1.5 to minus two. Um, that's not to say black is out of danger yet, and white uh, white would have ways to continue attacking, like bishop e5, f4. It would still be a very messy position. Um, however, let me show what happened in the game. After knight 6 to d7, uh, queen h5, hitting the rook, hitting the pawn. We actually repeated for a move. Knight went back to f6. I was hoping for repetition, but of course, white turned it down, queen g5. And now after king h8, this is where I really began to feel the pain. I should have played king f7. This would have offered me better chances at defending, but to play king f7 would have required a lot of courage given that the king just looks so exploitable here. The rook is able to come in. And at the time, I thought my king was better on h8, just hiding in the corner. I was thinking about playing knight h7 soon. Um, the problem is after bishop e5, I get in a situation where I'm completely stuck because my knight's tied down, completely pinned. My king has nowhere to go. All the squares around the king are controlled by white. And it's very, very difficult to escape the bind in this position. So I went ahead, I played queen e6 here. And now Susan plays a very powerful move. Pawn f4, reinforcing the bishop, maybe allowing the rook lift in future cases. Also making it so if I want to trade queens with queen g4, queen digs g5, but pawn can recapture and there'd be even more pressure against my knight. So f4 was a very nice way of just increasing the, the king side attack. Um, I went ahead and played queen f7, just trying to turtle up, still uh, enjoying the fact I'm up two pieces, but that was really the only thing to, to like about my position, was after queen h6, knight h7, and bishop g6. This is where I start losing back my material advantage. I went ahead and played queen g8. Really, really trying to just hug my king tightly with uh, with my pieces, but then rook c7, and white's 
pieces are coming in from all directions. Both of my knights are now pinned. My bishop is basically pinned to the knight on h7. If we look, black is almost completely paralyzed here. It's very, very difficult to find a move. And it was an incredible play by, uh, by Susan, who at the same time was playing dozens of other games and was able to produce such a masterpiece against such an innocent child. So I tried here. I, I played bishop e6, finally developing my light squared bishop. Unfortunately, um, actually, this, this does allow maiden 3, which white missed in the game. Uh, Susan found uh, another kind of brutal way of, of finishing me off with rook takes e7. But if you do want to try and find the checkmate in 3, which Susan Polgar missed, feel free to pause the video. But I will go ahead and show white can take on f6. And after I have to take back, there's rook h7, queen h7. This would have finished the game a bit more efficiently. But what happened in the game uh, was also just completely destructive after rook e7, rook e7, bishop f6. We reached a position where I had to play the really sad move, rook g7. And this is not the definition of fun, at least for black. This is really fun for white, though. And it's it's actually a very aesthetic setup where I'm just completely pinned down and tied down. If my queen ever moves away, then I get mated with queen h7. And uh, okay, Susan just ended my pain by winning material, takes on h7, takes on g7, takes on e6, and got a position where white is up four pawns and still has a, a mating attack. After I played one more move, queen h4, rook c7, I resigned in this position given that white is either mating me like this or mating me like if king h8, there's queen here and then mate. So I threw in the towel and uh, ended up losing after 31 moves, which uh, I was okay about. I wasn't too upset given the way in which I lost. Uh, the mistakes I made in this game were a bit more subtle. Like there wasn't one clear blunder which caused me to lose. It was just the fact that I played very passive in the opening. I gave my uh, a very strong opponent a tactical opportunity, which uh, she jumped on, and then I didn't find the the computer like moves to defend. So it's a cool game. I hope you guys enjoy that. And before I end the video, I want to share one uh, last photo. Um, I know I shared this one earlier in 2003. A few months ago in May, Susan Polgar actually retired from being the Webster University chess coach and had a retirement party. And at that party, we, uh, we recreated the photo from 2003, um, about 18 years later. And uh, yeah, I, I grew up a little bit. She's still sitting in a chair, probably a slightly different chair. That yeah, was really cool to have played her in the Simul and then attended Webster to be coached by her. And um, she's still doing amazing things in the chess world. So. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. And if you liked it, feel free to leave a comment, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content.